Our last episode showed the first vertebrates with legs, elbows, feet, and fingers that were able to crawl out of the water and onto the land. Acanthostega and Ichthyostega are often referred to as early tetrapods, but a tetrapod is defined as a four-limbed stegocephalian that is skeletally adapted to dry land. Acanthostega wasn't able to move its legs into a weight-bearing position. Ichthyostega could, but it could barely drag itself along and wasn't much more capable than a fish out of water. So it's not really fair to refer to either of these as actual tetrapods, but they're both prime examples of transitional species. By fusing three of its seven fingers into one, it seems that Ichthyostega also established the first pentadactyl hand, which eventually and perhaps convergently became the standard for all tetrapoda. Various lineages have lost one or more digits since. Horses lost all but one, for example. But pentadactyl digits has been the basic template ever since. Although, curiously, the, the gene for six fingers is typically dominant in humans. Strange, but true. When we look at Hynerpidon, now we see something that can actually walk, or at least crawl, as effectively as modern salamanders can. It still can't stay out of the water for very long, because it will dry out and die if it does, but it should at least qualify for the title of tetrapod. As its forerunners, Acanthostega and Ichthyostega, were not terribly efficient either on land or in the water, it's easy to see how forms like these wouldn't last especially long and would soon be replaced by more efficient forms, because there was an unprecedented selective pressure applied to any lineage that was even slightly more efficient at living on land. And that's the nature of extremely transitional species like these. Harvard paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould pointed this out in one of the laws of evolution, which he called punctuated equilibrium. It's the observation that in the history of any lineage, there will be mostly periods of relative stasis punctuated by significant change in accordance with or in response to occasional situational dynamics. During these periods, such as the exploration of a new environmental niche, some transitional species would be initially adequate in their new capacity, but would be quickly outperformed by better adapted descendants who would, of course, persist much longer. Thus, the more obviously transitional species would be comparatively rare in the fossil record. And note that the laws of evolution don't permit a change between kinds primarily because there is no taxonomic definition of a kind, and also because evolution is summarily defined as descent with inherent genetic modification. So instead of the undefined fish kind turning into an inaccurately defined amphibian kind, it's one lineage of stegocephalians acquiring new adaptations to a new environment. So these are definitely transitional species, and they may even be a new kind, but they're still the same kind, too. You belong to every clade your ancestors did, even if you started a new one that doesn't include them, because you can't grow out of your ancestry. That's why cladistic classification is monophyletic, meaning that if it's descended from a tetrapod, it's always a tetrapod, no matter how much their descendants may change. So snakes are still tetrapods, even though they don't have four legs anymore, and whales are still tetrapods, even though they're no longer adapted for life on dry land. We'll talk more about both of those in another video after we've finished with this series. Once the first tetrapods appeared on land, they spread out quickly. All these others are known from fossils found around the world of the Carboniferous period. That's the geologic period following the Devonian. The Carboniferous was a 60 million year period of lush and often swampy forests, mostly of lycopod trees. Trees use cellulose and lignin for skeletal support. Lignin is a tough substance. Today, dead trees are broken down by several different bacteria, which apparently didn't exist yet in the Carboniferous. So when all these trees died, they didn't decompose. They just piled up on top of each other and eventually became compressed into the coal deposits that were still burning today. That's why coal is called a fossil fuel. And remember that coal is just carbon, and 90% of our coal comes from this period, which is why it's called the Carboniferous. In this episode, we're only talking about the first half of that period, a subperiod known as the Mississippian. The world wasn't as warm as it was in the Ordovician or in the Silurian. It was much more temperate, but the sea level was still higher than it is today, hundreds of feet higher. So the visible continents were much smaller, with much of the continental shelves submerged in shallow seas. Thus, it was obviously a much more humid environment. And most of these early tetrapods would have looked like large salamanders, but some of them were starting to look more like lizards, too. And at this point in our cladogram, we come to a fork in the road. On the left, we have reptiliomorphs. And that's not just reptiles, but anything that looks like reptiles. Basically, anything that looks lizard-like, which would include some of our early ancestors as well. We could also call this group Anthracosauria, because it includes reptile-like amphibians, in the sense that they're amphibious, but not actually amphibians. 
On the right, we have Batrachomorpha, which means frog form, meaning that true amphibians are down this path. And now you may have thought that Acanthostega, Ichthyostega, Hynerpotens, Samuria, and all those were amphibians, and they are in the sense that they can live both on land and in water, but that's not a taxonomic clade. Another way to explain this is that dogs, cats, weasels, seals, mongooses, and hyenas all belong to the order Carnivora. Even pandas are part of that group, although they're not carnivorous. Crocodiles definitely are carnivorous, but they're not part of the order Carnivora because that's just a taxonomic grouping of mammals based on their phylogeny and the type of teeth that they have. So Carnivora doesn't mean everything that is carnivorous, nor does it mean that all Carnivorans are carnivores. Likewise, amphibia doesn't mean everything that is amphibious. It's a taxonomic clade including every actual newt or salamander, frog or toad, along with a few other things that you've never heard of and don't want to meet. Labyrinthodonts, for example. Now, these other animals we saw along the way up here weren't actually amphibians, they were just basal tetrapods, though it may be difficult to see the difference. On the more reptilian side were semi-amphibious anthracosaurs with drier, thicker skin like modern toads have, and something else too. A significant difference between reptiliaforms and amphibians is that amphibians can absorb all sorts of chemicals through their skin, including oxygen, both on land and in water. There are a few amphibians that have even lost their lungs and don't have gills either because if they're small and they're not very active, they don't need them. Because their skin is so permeable, they're also at risk of infection through osmosis. Reptiliaforms are different because their skin is keratinized, meaning that there's a layer of keratin proteins protecting against infection, as well as heat loss and UV radiation and so on, and helps the skin from drying out. This is just what you'd expect to evolve in anything spending a lot of time in open air and direct sunlight. Most chemicals will not soak through your skin because you have keratinized dermis everywhere, except that it's at its thinnest on your lips and your other pucker at the other end. And this keratin layer toughened the skin quite a bit, which it needed to, to keep out pathogens and just to get over the rocks and through the bushes. Excess keratin was expressed in most reptiliomorphs in the form of claws, which in later animals either thickened into hooves or thinned into fingernails. And some reptiliomorphs went even further, developing scales or scoots, which some mammals have also. And note that reptilian scales are made of keratin and formed in the epidermis, or outer layer of the skin. And they're different from fish scales, which are made of dermal bone. These were lost in amphibians, although some Sicilians still have a few dermal scales that are diminished and sparse. Sicilians are amphibians that have lost their legs and their eyes and sometimes even their lungs and look more like... Never mind. Um, let's just say it doesn't look like an intelligent design. But it does remind me of one of the more significant differences between reptiliomorphs and what we traditionally recognize as amphibians. And that is a necessary appendage of sex. Amphibians couple together such that the male and female both release their gametes at the same time in a practice that is similar to and based on spawning. But reptiliomorphs usually engage in coitus such that the sperm meet egg at ovulation and fertilize internally. These adaptations allowed reptiliomorphs to stay out of the water indefinitely, except when it came time to reproduce. Then the female still had to lay their eggs in the water, and we'll talk about how they got around that in the next video. For right now, remember that every living tetrapod is either a reptiliform or an amphibian, one or the other. So, look at your hands. Do you recognize your anthracosaurian pentadactyly? Even if your polydactyl is still counts because of you know, genetic dominance. But look at your watertight, keratinized skin and fingernails. If you also have an appendage that looks a wee bit like a Sicilian, do you understand that all of that means that you're classified as a reptiliform, 